so uh, I'm Isaac Schluter, as he said. I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, some interesting things, hopefully. Uh, this, is, this is probably not the kind of talk that you usually see at a tech conference. And I think really maybe it should be. I mean, we're, we're here because we have this technology in common of, of Node.js, but I think the lesson of you know, JSConf and NodeCamp and all these other sorts of community conferences is that it's really the community that, um, that these events are about, right? And really, Node is not the typical tech community. So I've had the honor of being able to spend my, my days and nights and weekends uh, working with this technology and interacting with the people who have been a part of it and who are passionate about it and watching the community grow from just a handful of guys in, a, in an IRC channel to this you know, big worldwide thing where there's conferences, seems like, every weekend. And, um, it's really, it's really incredible, and I think it's going to continue because of a couple of uh, really awesome, like really interesting patterns that we've, we've sort of stumbled upon in the Node community. Um, and I, I think that one day it's, it's actually not going to be that uncommon. Um, I think that the, the Node community is going to be pretty typical of technology communities that we have in the future because this, this pattern is going to continue, like I said. So in the next uh, 28 minutes or so, I, I'd like to talk about some of the things that make the Node community um, kind of interesting and, and why the patterns that we're developing here are going inevitably to be copied and built upon. And really, this all comes down to human nature, right? Because you see, software communities, technology communities are made out of people. And they, you know, they're made out of human beings. And if you think about it, what are humans? We're the most socially active of all of the great apes, right? If you, if you look at all of the mammals, uh, primates are some of the most social of those, and humans are the primates with the most interesting and complicated social interactions. And in fact, some anthropologists have, have suggested that the reason why we're so smart is just there to, you know, the reason why we have this big frontal cortex and, and linguistic ability and so on is just there so that we can facilitate more complicated social interactions. Uh, in, in an evolutionary sense, our need for Facebook made us smart enough to invent Facebook. I've, uh, I've always really liked reading and learning about anthropology because it's, it's really the study in a very direct way of what we are and where we came from. And really, everything we do, we do because humans do it, right? Um, being a social primate means that we're obsessed with what other humans are doing, and that's why you're all here, like, gathering in a room, listening to me talk about the fact that we're all here gathered in a room talking about things like this. So our story starts a little while ago. Um, a little while in evolutionary terms, anyway. Um, about five million years ago, give or take, was the last common ancestor between the Pan and Homo genuses. By the way, is anybody in here like a creationist? Not believe in evolution? Sorry. Um, but anyway, about five million years ago, give or take, there was the, the last common ancestor between the Pan and Homo uh, genuses. And it's Homo is in Homo sapiens. Homo Neanderthalus, Homo erectus, like people, basically. And uh, pan as in chimps and bonobos. Um, and that, that's basically where we split off from one another about five million years ago, which is not a very long time, evolutionarily speaking. In fact, it's so recent that some people have suggested that the pan and homo genuses should really be the same thing. So we should call chimps homo, uh, homo troglodytus, and bonobos should be homo paniscus rather than pan paniscus. So, in other words, like, we're so closely related that we're basically the third species of chimp. Um, it, genetically speaking, it's, those two split off from one another only one million years ago. So, genetically speaking, it's like they're in the same building or they're roommates. We're the next door neighbor, and then the other great apes are across town somewhere. Um, about a quarter of a million years ago, we find the first anatomically modern humans. So, if you went back in time in your time machine a quarter million years, and you plucked somebody out of you know, wherever, they were wandering around, um, and then teleported them back through your time machine to today, you'd find somebody who's just like you and me. Like, you, they wouldn't be indistinguishable from any other human, but they'd be, you know, minus obviously a whole lot of technology like JavaScript and Guinness and time machines. And you'd almost certainly see that they made their living, as it were, by, uh, by looking for edible things in a forest. Until about 10,000 years ago, all humans were hunter-gatherers. Uh, they had these, these you know, hunter-gatherer lifestyles. And a few societies today still do, but they're extremely rare. And there's been a lot of interaction with them, with modern humans, so um, they're not, you know, we can get some insights from them, but they're not exactly the same. 
the, the key component to a hunter-gatherer or immediate return lifestyle in those types of societies was that they had to keep moving from place to place and that they were fiercely egalitarian. So what that means is literally everything is shared. Um, hunting is a group activity and you don't always catch something. So if I don't share with you, then that means you don't share with me. And then the first time one of us doesn't catch something, we all die, right? So that's, that doesn't work out. Um, and also everything that you have has to continually be picked up and moved to a new place. So there's really no room for ownership of anything. But it wasn't like a big hippie love fest where everybody, you know, we all just share everything because we love each other so much. It was just people who don't share are shunned and in some cases killed. So it's, th there's just literally no room for selfishness in that kind of an environment. And so the society doesn't tolerate it. And if you, if you look at the whole time that humans have been on this planet, uh, there was 250,000 years that we were wandering around catching fish and, you know, killing animals and, and gathering fruit and, and bugs and whatnot. And then about 10,000 years ago, we suddenly stopped moving around and started farming starchy plants. We'd already domesticated certain animals, so it was really like going from hunter-gatherer to nomadic herdsmen to farmers. But the, in evolutionary terms, the shift was very, very quick, right? And it was dramatic and swift, and mostly one way. So now there was, there was more food, and it was all in one place. This is clearly great, right? Um, I mean, with a surplus of food, and you, you don't need to move around. So you get societies growing very quickly, and there's a lot of other things that show up as well. Um, you get all this stuff, right? Because you don't have to move around so much so you can keep more stuff. And also fewer babies died, which is great because you're, you're getting more calories. Um, and since you had more, more uh, like a surplus of food, you could trade it with other societies. Trade meant that we needed a way to write things down. And then these oral traditions and our stories started getting written down and each generation could build on the one before. So you see an explosion in technology ever since then. Well, really, the only increase in technology, like it kind of started when we started farming. But not all was wonderful in early farming societies. And in fact, some of these problems we're still dealing with today. Um, the, the first farming societies that we have records of, uh, one of the earliest is called, a place called Chattel Hayek in, um, in Turkey. And it, it was from around uh, 12,000 to 10,000 years ago that people lived in these like basically a 10 by 10 foot uh, clay room, and they were just stacked right on top of one another. So like the, there was a hole in the top with a ladder, and they still had no personal possessions. They still had, you know, it was basically a hunter-gatherers that were living in one place. And um, these little mound cities grew very quickly. And in the studies that they've done of the, the bones of the people who live there, they, say, they show terrible malnutrition. So even though people are starving less often, they're, they're basically eating junk food. And the average male height falls in, during this time in our evolutionary history, falls from about 200 centimeters down to 160. I mean, that's like, that's a big drop, right? And we're, we're still not back up to where we were, um, although it's been kind of steadily increasing ever since then, because now we have better nutrition, you know, tall people don't die. Um, but when you're not getting enough nutrition, being tall is a really, you know, terrible liability, because now you have like more of a body to support. So all those people living on top of one another also leads to an explosion in infectious diseases, and we're living with our animals, so you get zoological pathogens, it's no good. But I don't want to make it seem like, oh, I'm some, you know, Rousseau, noble savage type of point here. There's a lot of problems with being a hunter-gatherer, too. Um, one bad season can kill you all. Like, that's one of the reasons why the population didn't grow that fast. Uh, babies die really often because they're more susceptible to not getting enough nutrition. So there's, you know, really high infant mortality. And worst of all, there's sorcerers that can hex you. And you just got to kill those motherfuckers. So they're going to hex everybody. And even worse than that is if you, get accused, if you get accused of being a sorcerer, like you're just a couple dozen guys out in the woods. Sorry, buddy. Um, so it, having a legal system and science and stuff is actually kind of a nice perk, right? Uh, most interestingly, I think, is that there's, there's two things that show up that were not at Chattel Hayek, but they show up uh, shortly afterwards. We started making shields and walls. The reason why this is so interesting is that it, in the remains of hunter-gatherers, there's all of this weaponry. They actually had kind of a lot of time to sit around, and um, their job was to kill stuff. So there was um, 
a fair amount of weaponry, like really creative, just gnarly looking things. I mean, they had, uh, they had these like awesome spears and bows and arrows with like flint arrowheads and big gnarly knives and everything. But you don't see any defensive artifacts um, during the Neolithic period, and, or until the Neolithic period rather. And that's interesting because, I mean, the reason for that is that animals don't shoot back at you when you're shooting at them. So you don't need a shield for hunting, and you don't need walls because like, there's nothing that's going to come get your stuff because you have no stuff. But humans started being um, offensive and violent with one another in a, in a systematic way right around the same time that we started farming. When I first learned this, it seemed really strange to me because it seemed like, well, if we have a surplus, why would we now start fighting with each other? And it, it, it seems more like people get you know, more bent out of shape when there isn't a surplus, when there's not enough to go around. So I want to back up the evolutionary chain just a little bit and check out that other fork in the road. So this, this story also starts in Africa, but a little bit more recently. In uh, 1960, in Gombe, the, uh, there was a, it's a nature, nature preserve in Africa. And uh, in 1960, Jane Goodall, I'm sure you've heard of her before. She went and lived with the chimps and followed them around. And a lot of the things that we know about chimpanzees today, we kind of take for granted, but at the time, not very much was known about them. There were some that we had uh, captured and studied in captivity. We knew that you could train them to like, ride bicycles and smoke cigars, but they didn't know much about how they lived in the wild. So for five years ago, for five years, uh, good old traipsed around in the jungle and took notes and bonded with these chimps and watched them do things. And she said that they were rather more peaceable than human beings. In fact, when one of them would find food on a, on a tree or they would find like a, a ripe banana tree, they would call out to other chimps to come and, and share. In the, in the spoils, because there wasn't enough that, you know, there was so much on one tree, like they, they weren't going to keep it, right? I mean, this is the original hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So they found a bunch of data, then there were two more expeditions that went back. But this time, they said, well, let's not waste a whole bunch of time traipsing around in the jungle. Like, it took her five years, she didn't really get that much data. We really want to get a lot more interaction with the chimps. So they started handing out food at regular intervals to get the chimps to come to the camp so that they could observe their behavior. And what they found was a very, very different type of animal. Um, whereas they had previously been immediate return foragers, now the chimps could smell ripe fruit in, this, in boxes, and they just drove them crazy because they couldn't get at it. And they, they, they've, never had, they've never had to deal with that situation before. So they would tear these boxes apart, and the researchers kept having to come up with stronger and stronger locks to, to hide away the bait food. And then what's more, the, uh, the chimps started setting up patrols around the camp. So groups of young males would circle the camp at like regular spots. And if any, uh, if any outsider who wasn't part of their group came anywhere near the camp, they would just brutally attack them. Um, and I mean, previously they'd always worked together with these other groups, but now they were, with the advent of the bait food, they became very territorial and antagonistic. And I mean, then there was cannibalism, rape, like infanticide, like it just every terrible kind of chimp atrocity happened right around this camp. And I think the takeaway from this is really pretty fascinating, both with our history and, and with this observation, is that when our food is all in one place, we don't feel like we have to work together. In fact, we feel like we have to keep other people away from it and hoard it. And, and rather than a surplus making us feel better about each other, sometimes it actually makes us feel worse or uh, behave worse towards one another. We break up into teams, we get political and antisocial. Now, the data from these, um, from these expeditions came under fire for, uh, because the research methods were obviously influencing the chimp behavior. So they sent out some more expeditions to, to observe the same troops of chimps in the same area, and they, but to follow a more naturalistic method where they follow them around. So what do you think happened? Not much of a change. Uh, their level of anxiety and aggression wasn't as high because they didn't have the stressor of all the bananas locked in boxes, but the chimps in the area were permanently more antagonistic towards one another than, uh, than when Jane Goodall had gone on her first visit. So in other words, after the introduction of the bait food, they didn't just go back to being, domestic, being you know, nice. The changes were cultural, similar to how if you domesticate an animal and then let them out into the wild, it's not the same kind of animal anymore. They stay domesticated to a certain degree. And also, what this kind of shows is from 10,000 years ago, ever since the Neolithic Revolution, we humans domesticated ourselves and we've been living in captivity ever since. So fast forward to the present day, and let's look at the major revolutions that we've gone through as a species. Uh, we went from immediate return hunter-gatherer foragers to an agricultural society. 
And the next, you know, that kind of stayed mostly unchanged for a while with, you know, moderate improvements until we had the Industrial Revolution. And I guess you could make the case that the Information Revolution is still happening. Or you could even say that the Information Revolution and the Industrial Revolution are really just two parts of the same thing, which are, we go from finding it to growing it to using machines to do stuff for us. Our machines have gotten a lot more interesting, and now we're at the point where we even use them to communicate with one another and to think. But in order for something to be a revolution, it has to be disruptive. And truly disruptive technology doesn't just do something in a new way, right? It's not a better mousetrap. It does something in such a way that the old ways of doing things no longer make sense. Because the sorts of scarcity that those techniques were designed around no longer exist, right? So after farming, the hunter-gatherer lifestyle wasn't just different, it was gone. Um, and now that we've started down the road of the Industrial Revolution, we can't unmake those changes, right? We can't uninvent the, the uh, printing press or the internet or the steam engine. But in order for a disruption to happen, it also has to tap into a fundamental thing in our nature and come at the right time in history when we're all sort of ready as a society to accept it. And also, disruption is not always great at first. In fact, it causes sometimes terrible, terrible problems. I mean, the Industrial Revolution is like, kind of made our environment crap, um, but has all these other benefits. And we're trying to figure out, like, how do we keep the benefits and, and fix the problems? So I think we also, in, in the tech world, we like to think of information technology as being disruptive. But I think that we tend to overestimate how much of a revolution has already happened and how much of it is still yet to come. Because really, the shift from being a peasant worker working for a nobleman, a peasant serf or whatever, and being, now being a cog in a corporate machine, it's not really that big of a difference. Um, it's a little bit better because you're not you know, probably breaking your back, but you're like getting carpal tunnel syndrome instead. It's, um, and you, you work for a company, and that ba company basically calls all the shots. They decide what to build, and then they build walls around it so that nobody else can get at it. Until the last few generations, in fact, the assumption for a lot of people was that you'd work at the same company for most or all of your life. And then the company would like, you know, dole out the, the value you create and create some artificial scarcity around it in order to, uh, to extract profit. So what happens when somebody comes along and points out that that scarcity is imaginary? Or what happens when we invent something that makes it no longer scarce? So that's what real disruption is. I'm certainly not the first to remark that knowledge work has the potential to be different. Um, and in fact, it really has to be approached differently from the standard model. Uh, from the standard industrial model. If you search for, uh, search the internet for programmer anarchy or uh, anarchy and taco conf, you'll find a lot of, uh, a few other interesting talks about it. Um, Fred George is actually here, he's bumped into him this morning. Uh, his talk is really interesting. It, it goes over like what, in a lot of ways, why Agile kind of isn't enough. Um, but in, in all of these things, the basic thesis of this point is that the more, uh, the more freedom you give to your knowledge workers, the more they end up accomplishing. Strict hierarchies provide some useful features, but they're actually a net loss in most cases in terms of overall productivity. Because practically by definition, programmers and all knowledge workers really are heading into the unknown, and they know more about it than their boss does. Otherwise, they wouldn't have hired them. So why not get rid of this whole concept of a boss telling you what to do, and an employee, and just let them do whatever they want? But this still assumes that we have a, a company of some sort, like, you know, owning and, and sort of running things. And certainly, a lot of open source projects have, to some degree, a company behind them. Uh, Node.js is sponsored by Joint. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a Joint employee, and, and they own the name and the logo and what have you. But a lot of open source projects are managed by companies in a somewhat weird way. Um, Brian Cantrell, I, ironically, I, I tease him and, and call him my manager, and he hates it. Um, he, uh, he did a talk at Fizzly called Corporate Open Source Anti-Patterns that I, I also recommend checking out. Has a lot of, uh, it, it's almost as if a lot of companies have heard that, oh, open source is great and you know, a tech community can do a lot to help your technology and so they say, yeah, we're open. And then they just do everything that you can possibly imagine to completely destroy and pollute the, the, the community and destroy everything around it. I think it's very difficult for most corporate cultures to come to grips with the idea that we get more out of a technology the more that we break down those walls and just give away as much as we can get away with. And also, I think what a lot of people don't 
might not realize about Node is that it's not just a Joyent product. Uh, in fact, most of the people working on it don't work at Joyent. And most of the value of Node doesn't come from the core, um, from the core Node project itself, from the binary, but it comes from all of these other modules that people are publishing that you guys are writing and, and putting in, in NPM. And also, uh, not much about Node is actually all that new. I mean, async I.O. is as old as the hills, and there's been plenty of other really popular and, and interesting module systems and so on. I, I think Node is just an example of a lot of good ideas all kind of falling together around the same time. And now that it's been done, we can't undo it, right? We can't help but push it further. And so I want to go over what some of those ideas are and how they kind of relate back to the stuff about uh, farming and chimps and whatnot. Um, so one, one principle in Node is this, this idea of a very small core and then a very noisy user land. We have a relatively small set of uh, core functionality in the binary itself. The general guideline is it's everything you need to sort of bootstrap a network program and an um, and active user land. The structure and the process for adding things into the NPM registry into user, as user land modules is much, much lower than the typical programming community. So there's no, there's no risk of like, oh, you know, I need to make sure that nobody else is also building a test framework before I build mine. Like, no, just go do it. So we'll have a thousand test frameworks. Who cares? It's better to have that than, and, and that noise um, and, and this prolific community of wheel reinventors. That ends up actually being better than having to stop and wait and ask for permission and, and have all these other things. And the modules that people write, there's this, like I said, this very open mentality. So there's nothing stopping you from writing multiple competing implementations of, of something. There's no like cabal that has to give you permission. And also, you don't have to get anything into the core binary in order for it to be popular or useful. You can become a famous node module developer without ever landing a single patch into the core node binary. And what's really interesting to me about this is just how much stress it seems to relieve. I mean, we, we implemented things this way because we wanted to make sure that there was a lot of uh, interesting things being built and we're too lazy to build them all ourselves. But um, not only is this, this noisiness not a problem in practice, it ends up with this feeling of like very expansive feeling of, uh, blah. it ends up creating this very expansive feeling of elbow room, right? I don't have to feel like your module is a threat to mine just because we do the same thing in slightly different ways. Uh, fierce egalitarianism, this principle shows itself in this modern day coder GTFO attitude. Virtually there is no tolerance in the node community from what I've seen for this idea of planning to open source. You know, we're, we're announcing our intention to create a committee to investigate the possibility of open sourcing some of our code. Like, no, yeah, we don't care. Um, either you share the code and you can see it and it's on GitHub or there's really nothing to talk about. No one really wastes any time or attention on non-existent programs. And that's unfortunately very typical in a lot of um, software communities, especially in the world of proprietary software. But here, I mean, really anybody can work with anyone else or in isolation. And when the pieces are cut up properly, I can use just part of your program rather than having to take the whole thing. GitHub has also made this a lot better. As uh, Michael Rogers pointed out recently on his blog, there's this whole generation gap between open source programmers now where GitHub has just made it a different game, and it's a different type of thing now. So by keeping user land vibrant and the core really small, it makes it feel like we're all sort of wandering in this wilderness together, trying to, uh, trying to solve the problems that we run into, rather than wasting time fighting over whose patch gets blessed and gets put into the core library. And rather than having this, you know, so rather than having a preordained structure where you go through and fill in the necessary bits, this approach leads itself more um, more easily to a pattern where you solve problems in reusable nuggets, like Unix philosophy style, and then just sort of observe the, the structure that emerges. Because really, the structure is not a primary piece of making a functional community or a functional program. And I, I use the word functional here as the opposite of dysfunctional, right? Not like FP functional. And this was actually going to be the whole point of my talk, which is why it says uh, post-structuralism in module systems in the, in the um, in the print, and I was, you know, made a last minute change because I'm crazy anarchist. And, um, <laughs> but it sort of, uh, what I found was that as I was doing all this research and thinking about it, is that it's the, well, the, the chimp and farming stuff was more interesting, I thought. But um, I think that uh, 
when the structure sort of emerges out of the, the thing that you're building, it ends up, you end up writing better software than when you start out with this like object-oriented or functional approach first and foremost, and then try and fill in the blanks. And um, one of the, the, the idea of emergent structure is one of the core principles of, of post-structuralism in as much as there is such a thing anyway. And it's also a really good way to look at how our communities and how they grow and how they can get along with one another. When we set out to build a structure and then fill it in, it's not just that we will build the wrong thing, it's that we won't notice when we've built the wrong thing until it's too late, and then it won't be easy to fix it. Um, raise your hand if you've ever read this book, if you recognize this title, Clay Shirky. Oh, sh shame on you. Everybody who doesn't have your hands up, like, go download this book right now. I feel like this is, this is more homework than I've ever given in a talk before. It's awesome. You guys are gonna be so busy. Um, but if you're an inter internet person and you're interested in how the internet works and, and how it's changing our society, you really need to go read this. And I think by the end of the forward, you'll see why this dude's my hero. A lot of things that make Node what it is and make Node so exciting and interesting are the same things that make the internet exciting and interesting and make it what it is. And Node and the, the open source collaboration that we're pushing is basically, as I see it, the natural expression of the internet in a software platform. And then it's enabling us to do more interesting things with the internet and on the internet, and it ends up being this feedback loop. And that's why this pattern can only continue. It might sound a little far-fetched, but I think that this way of organizing ourselves, where we try to agree on as little as possible, and then we explore out from there with the greatest degree of freedom possible, it's, um, and then just sort of see what happens naturally, it works well because in some way, it, I think it speaks to our innermost sort of longings for the things that we gave up when we left the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. To the, you know, it speaks to the millions of years of evolution that made us what we are before we tried to start changing it just a couple thousand years ago. And I think also it's interesting that uh, other software communities are starting to pick up this model. So you see uh, admin-free module deployment systems po uh, popping up for uh, client-side JavaScript, for Cordova plugins, for PHP. There's a thing called Packagist, which is pretty neat, and so on. So what we're seeing is not the end of the journey, it's just the beginning. And my hope is that in the next five or 10 years or 20 years, whatever, we look back on Node and laugh about how stifling and restrictive the Node, module, node model of uh, collaboration was. I think that the, the core binary, the core of Node is actually way too big. And it's, 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 consist, it's still a constant source of, of contention, right? If people want to put a little, add another core module or whatever into it, it's, it's very difficult, we have to kind of de have these debates and discussions and figure out what's gonna work. And so the question though is how can we make it much smaller? And maybe the answer to this is, well, whatever comes after Node is the thing that's gonna be, you know, that's gonna achieve this dream. Um, and also how can we take this open modular approach to like, you know, more serious projects like, a, like an operating system or a virtual machine? I'm not, really sure, but I, I think that it can be applied, and I, I think that ultimately something like this really has to, because if we want to keep seeing the kinds of improvements and return on investment that we've seen in the, in the Node community, then we're going to have to apply the same model to other areas. I mean, if the future is going to require us to have new ideas, then we've got to figure out how to shape our communities so that we have room to have those ideas without threatening each other or, you know, bumping elbows all the time and having to... to be offended when somebody else has a similar idea that we have. So that's it. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.